Good morning. I am Dr. Michael Lynch, Professor of National Security Affairs at the Strategic Studies Institute. On behalf of Dr. Carol Evans, Director of the Strategic Studies Institute at the U.S. Army War College, I would like to thank New America for the opportunity to present this panel today. A quick disclaimer. The views expressed here are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense policy. I'll first introduce our speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Robert Hamilton, Research Professor of Eurasian Studies at the Strategic Studies Institute of the U.S. Army War College. Dr. Hamilton will address three questions today. How did each side formulate its strategy for the war? How did it translate that strategy into a war plan? And how has each side adjusted its strategy over the course of the war so far? Our second speaker is Dr. Antulio J. Echeverria, who's the editor-in-chief of the U.S. Army War College Press, which includes Parameters, the U.S. Army War College Journal. Dr. Echeverria will talk about how observations from Ukraine's total defense concept can provide the basis for building an integrated defense, which can in turn help us enhance integrated deterrence. Our final speaker is Dr. John Denny, Research Professor of Security Studies at the Strategic Studies Institute of the U.S. Army War College. Dr. Denny will address the role of U.S. allies in supporting Ukraine, the observations and lessons learned from that support, and the implications for U.S. strategy and competition with China and Russia. And with that, I'll hand the mic over to Dr. Hamilton. Uh, thanks, Mike, and good morning, everybody. So as Mike said, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about strategy and planning uh, during the war and how each side adjusted the strategy based on uh, conditions in the war. Uh, I'll caveat it up front by saying we actually know, or at least I know, uh, a lot more about uh, the Russian side than I do the Ukrainian side. And I think that's true for many uh, researchers in the war. Part of the reason for that is that there, there are more people studying the Russian strategy and planning process, uh, strategic aims in the war and how those have been adjusted over the war, uh, over the course of the war, because uh, Russia is a great power and a, a competitor. Uh, and uh, also part of the reason is the Ukrainian, frank, fr Ukrainian side, frankly, has been so tight-lipped, their OPSEC has been so good, they tell us only what we need to know to help them. And so uh, I, I feel like, at least for me, my understanding of the Russian side is actually better than the Ukrainian side. But what we've seen uh, over the course of the war from Russia is a contraction of war aims and a more realistic set of assumptions that their strategy and plans are based on. And that's based on uh, the failure of their initial strategy. And what we've seen from Ukraine, I think, is an expansion of war aims based on uh, the incremental success that they've been having in blunting the initial Rus Russian assault and then going on the counteroffensive. Um, <clears throat> so we teach strategy here at the U.S. Army War College as uh, the relationship among ends or objectives, <coughs> ways or concepts, things you do, means uh, or resources. Uh, and so I'll go through what I, what I see as the initial strategy and then a couple of adjustments by, by both sides. Uh, I'll say that from my assessment, uh, Russia's ends or its objectives in the war have remained the same throughout the war. And those are to prevent Ukraine from escaping Russia's geopolitical orbit, reestablish what they see as a zone of privileged interests uh, in, over the former Soviet Union outside of the Baltics. For a lot of reasons, the Baltics have always been seen differently in Moscow than the other 12 republics of the former Soviet Union. And I think some of the evidence for this is if you look at the pre-war demands, uh, the, the Lavrov, the, the Russian foreign ministries, um, the, the, the draft treaty they put forward, Putin's article that he wrote the summer before the war started, those demands were all directed at the West over the heads of the Ukrainians, right? So the, the whole denazification, demilitarization justification for the war is clearly not what it's about. It's about, uh, it has n very little to do with things going on inside of Ukraine. It has to do with Russia's view of the geopolitical uh, space that it inhabits and uh, its prerogatives and rights within that space. Um, so again, the ends were, to, and still are, to prevent Ukraine from escaping Russia's geopolitical orbit and reestablish its zone, its self-declared zone of privileged interest, interests the ways in the initial strategy were sort of classic coup de mort, right? It was quick seizure of Kiev, kill, capture Zelensky and other key government officials, and install a pro-Russian government. That was the plan. Um, the means, primarily, the military means were primarily airborne special operations forces and then some of the other irregular forces, the Kadyrovtsi from, uh, from Chechnya, Wagner, and others. 
the conventional force, the idea for the conventional forces was they could clean up pockets of resistance from the armed forces of Ukraine after Kiev had been seized, the government had been uh, toppled and replaced with a more pro-Russian government. Uh, some of the assumptions, I think, that guided this, this strategy, the initial Russian strategy, was that Zelensky, the government in Kiev, were uh, the center of gravity, and I think that was actually correct. Um, a, one assumption that was wildly incorrect was that Russia could repeat Crimea 2014 on a national scale, essentially that the armed forces of Ukraine would not put up significant resistance, that the Ukrainian people would be passive or welcoming uh, to, to Russian invaders or liberators in the, in the Kremlin's view. Um, <clears throat> and I think this is evidence that this was not a plan, not a strategy that was developed or a plan that was written primarily by the Russian armed forces and the general staff. This came out of the Kremlin and the security services. There's been a lot of evidence for that. Um, but one of the inferences we can make just from the assumptions that guided the plan were this was not a classic military plan. It had heavy, heavy fingerprints from the Kremlin and the security services. So. That failed, and that failed by May of 2022. And so the first revision, if everyone remembers, the withdrawal uh, from most of the four axes, the two that were directed toward Kyiv, uh, and, and really the one that was uh, directed from the south out of Crimea, and a focus on, on the Donbass, on m mostly Donetsk and Luhansk provinces, uh, but also to an extent uh, Zaporizhia and Kherson, and it was the establishment of a Russian protectorate over uh, Eastern Ukraine. But the end was still the same. The end was prevent Ukraine from escaping Russia's geopolitical orbit. The way they were, they were going to do this um, was seize control over Eastern Ukraine, essentially try to, try to freeze the conflict, conflict and, and make Ukraine uh, a failed state or a state that was so unpalatable and attractive to the EU and NATO uh, that its, its membership in those organizations would become an impossibility. Um, the other thing Russia did as part of the ways of this strategy was it stepped up attacks on, on civilian targets. Uh, the idea was to terrorize and demoralize the Ukrainian pop population. Uh, and again, as I said, freeze the conflict to allow Russia to escalate it at, at its discretion and make Ukraine an unattractive uh, member for, of Western institutions. The means were an expanded conventional force through the partial mobilization that happened in August and September of 2022. And then, um, the aircraft and missile attacks on strategic targets or, or civilian targets. Uh, the assumption here, I think, was a center of gravity was Ukrainian will, which would falter after Russia seized large parts of eastern Ukraine, essentially uh, cut off Ukraine's access to the sea outside of the, the far uh, west in Odessa. Um, and the population eventually, after being subjected to these strikes, uh, on civilian targets uh, would, would push the government to end the war. That also t proved to be false. That, those assumptions failed. That strategy failed. So I think the second revision in Russian strategy, which, which we see now, and it started probably early this year, again, the ends are the same. Um, <clears throat> the ways, what they're trying to do, I think, is freeze the conflict, retain uh, leverage and the ability to escalate, operationally go on the defense, Strategic strikes over the winter you saw on energy infrastructure. After Russia pulled out of the grain deal this summer, you saw strikes on trade infrastructure and grain storage facilities. Um, and again, the idea here is to spread the cost of the war to countries dependent on, on grain imports from, from the Black Sea, from this part of the world. Uh, many in the global south, by the way, and I'm sure everyone in the audience knows this, uh, don't really blame Russia for the war. They see it as it's, it's on the one hand, on the other. Uh, and, but the idea here, one of the ideas, is to spread the cost of the war outside of the region uh, so that there is more incentive for countries outside of the region to freeze the conflict uh, and, and for Russia to retain what it has gained. So I think we're, we're seeing Russia on the operational defense. Um, the means it's pursuing the strategy, again, uh, UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, missiles, uh, diplomacy and information war to erode international support for Ukraine. I think the key, the change in assumptions here and the key assumption here from Russia is the center of gravity is no longer Ukrainian will, it's Western will. Uh, and Russia can outlast, Western will will degrade, it will falter. Uh, as Russia continues this war, the Russia strategy, I read a recent report that said uh, Russia's strategy now is not to, out, not to outlast Kiev, it's to outlast Washington. 
Uh, and I actually think that's the most, uh, that's, that's probably, unfortunately, uh, the most realistic assumption uh, in the Russian strategy that we've seen to date. Uh, to keep fighting, to freeze the war on the ground so that there are no major changes uh, in territorial control. I think Russia is incapable of, of major changes in territorial control. I think we're seeing Ukraine is, is gaining territory, but slowly and incrementally. Uh, and I think the, you know, Putin's theory of victory now is to outlast us, not to outlast the Ukrainians. So what we've seen with the Russians is that over time the strategy has improved, better alignment of ends, ways, and means, more realistic assumptions, uh, a better understanding of the true center of gravity uh, of, of the Ukrainians or of the, the, the Ukrainians and their partners that are facing Russia. On the Ukrainian side, um, I think the ends, the in, initially, uh, in the war, the ends were survival. It was re retain co control of Kyiv, preserve the functioning of the government. This is, um, you know, two key moments in this are, you know, President Zelensky's, I need ammunition, not a ride. Uh, in other words, uh, I, I'm not leaving. Uh, if we can retain control of, of, of the capital and the government can continue to function, we can survive the initial the stage of this war. Uh, and, and that's really, I think, at the beginning, that, those were the ends. Those were the objectives of Ukrainian strategy. Uh, the, other, the other, I think, key moment here is the video that Zelensky and some of his key leaders made a day or two into the war, uh, you know, literally a cell phone video that was posted, hey, the president's here, the minister of defense is here, we're here, we're still functioning, we're still fighting. Uh, and I think that was key um, to not only Ukrainian will, but to convincing Ukraine's Western partners uh, that they had a moment, they had some time. Uh, to marshal support, rally support, and keep Ukraine in the war because the Ukrainians were going to survive at least the initial attack, the initial, the initial shock. Uh, the ways are, are total defense, so mobilization of, of the entire government, the entire society to the extent it could be, the territorial reserve. Uh, it, so, sort of an interesting sidebar to this is some of the interviews I've done um, and some of the things I've read from people in the country uh, have made the point that the territorial reserve was a, a critical component of Ukraine's ability to initially survive and blunt the Rus Russian offensive. Uh, that, that these were forces that were appearing in places and at times that the Russians had not expected. Uh, and they weren't all that well trained or all that well armed, but they were well trained and well armed enough uh, to cause confusion uh, in, the Russian, in the Russian ranks and in the Russian plan uh, and to blunt the initial uh, Russian offensive. So <clears throat> the, the means I think Ukraine used early on in the war, obviously uh, total defense, but also high vault of multi-channel communications, especially in English coming out of Kyiv. And this was directed at us, at Ukraine's partners, to convince us this was not going to be 2008 in Georgia. This was not going to be a five-day war where the Russians could present the world with a fait accompli. This was going to be a longer war. Ukraine was going to stay in the war. Uh, and we had time uh, to, to marshal support, essentially to get our act together uh, and to step up the, uh, the uh, assistance to Ukraine uh, because that assistance would go to good use. It would, not be, uh, it, would not, it would not be lost or captured by the Russians within a week. Um, key assumptions, I think, for Ukraine initially were surviving the initial week were key to gaining and maintaining foreign support. Again, lessons of 2008, you've got to fight for more than four or five days. Uh, Ukraine obviously has natural advantages in terms of size that Georgia didn't have, both size of its military and size of the country. Uh, and that foreign support was key to surviving long term. Uh, and initially, there was a thinking, I think, in the Ukrainian government, if you go back to some of their initial statements, that land concessions and neutrality might be the cost of preserving independence. Some of Zelensky's initial statements and initial offers uh, talked about those things. As they survived uh, and as they continued to fight, and as I think they realized that the Russian plan had some fatal, uh, false, fatally false assumptions, uh, Ukraine's ends expanded to, and I think you started to see this around May, around the time that the Russians gave up the drive on Kyiv and, and started to focus on the east, um, Ukraine's objectives began switch to a return to the pre-February of 2022 status quo, to pushing Russians out of all the new uh, area that they had occupied since February 22. Uh, how they were going to reverse Russia's post-22, February 22 military gains, stabilize the situation through limited counteroffensive. These are the counteroffensives we saw in Kharkiv and Kherson. And then once HIMARS showed up, 
strikes on key Russian command and control and logistics nodes that continued to have to be pushed farther and farther back and, and complicated Russia's command and control and, and logistical support. Um, and I think the key assumption in this phase of the Ukrainian strategy was that the, the center of gravity were, was Russia's ground forces and their ability to hold ground. And then I think you saw a second revision in Ukrainian strategy uh, about a year ago, about the end of the summer, uh, after early fall, after the, uh, the offensives in Kharkiv and Kherson uh, had succeeded, and that was a return to the pre-2014 status quo. So ejection of all Rus Russian forces uh, from inside of Ukraine's internationally recognized borders and war crimes prosecutions and NATO membership. So if you talk to, and I'm sure many in the room have, if you talk to Ukrainians now, especially uh, military and political leaders, they will say, um, hey, we don't fear a long conflict. We fear an inconclusive conflict. Uh, and we know that that's Russia's strategy, is to make this a frozen conflict. Because a frozen conflict, I think, in, in the Russian mind and the fear is in the Ukrainian mind, will keep Ukraine out of NATO. And, and many Ukrainians believe the only way to keep this war from recurring in five years or ten years when Russia is ready for it to, to start again uh, is NATO membership and the Article 5 uh, deterrent uh, that it would provide, provide Russia. So the ways, how are the Ukrainians doing this? Break the will of the Russian military in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, Counteroffensives to liberate uh, Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, Kherson, isolate Crimea, I think. I, I, and again, this is just me. Uh, I, I don't think the Ukrainians have in mind a conventional military operation to liberate Crimea. I think for a lot of reasons they understand it would be extremely difficult, would invite uh, a, a radical escalation on the Russian side. I think the plan is to isolate it, convince the Russians it's untenable, and then go into some sort of negotiated settlement where its status is determined over time, maybe with some international uh, support and intervention. Um, what we're seeing, another thing we're seeing in Ukrainian strategy changing a little bit is these long-range uh, UAV and drone strikes on symbolic and uh, defense industrial targets in Russian-occupied parts of Ukraine and in Russia itself. Uh, to degrade war-making capability of Russia, to erode the confidence of the military, maybe to, to send the, uh, the message to the Russian people that the Kremlin started the war of choice that it now cannot protect Russia from. They've been very careful not to strike civilian targets like the Russians have in Ukraine because that, uh, that could actually bolster support for the war, right, by, by giving the Kremlin and, and the Russian people uh, ammunition to say the Ukrainians are committing war crimes. So the strikes have been very targeted on symbolic government and defense industrial targets. Um, the means are the expanded ground conventional capability, the, the, all the tanks, all the armored personnel carriers, uh, air and sea drones, Western provided uh, long range artillery, missiles, storm shadow obviously we think was used uh, in, the, in the recent attack uh, in Sevastopol last week. Uh, the question now of course is attack them because that would put everything in Crimea within range uh, of Ukrainian long range artillery. Um, so I think I'll, I'll end here with the key assumptions is, uh, on the Ukrainian side now. One of the key assumptions is will. Russian will is the center of gravity. Not necessarily the, the will of the military, but the will of the Kremlin. Um, and the Ukrainians believe that the, the will to fight comes from fear, compensation for the military, because uh, people are, are very well compensated if they're killed, and, and that provides almost a perverse incentive. Uh, for, for people to sign up because the death benefits are significant. Uh, and then the propaganda, the propaganda effort from the Kremlin and, and its, its surrogates directed not only at the Russian military, but the Russian people. So I'll stop here, uh, turn it over to Tony, and look forward to your questions. Morning, everyone. Can I have some? All right, so I'm going to talk this morning a little bit about uh, uh, why deterrence failed in February 2022. Uh, six main answers for that. Um, there are others out there, I'm sure, uh, and none of these is mutually exclusive necessarily. Um, and then the West strategic challenge, one of the things I think we have to address if we want deterrence to have uh, better prospects for success moving forward. And then a way to achieve integrated deterrence through an integrated defense using uh, roughly the Ukrainian model of uh, comprehensive defense or total defense. Bob alluded to that and even though it was underfunded and um, not as tightly organized as it might have been, it did just enough, it seems to me and to others, uh, other analysts, 
to uh, prevent the fait accompli. And so I think that's, uh, again, part of the speech challenge we need to address and so on. So, okay, next slide, please. So, okay, six major answers as to why deterrence failed um, in February of 2022. The first one, miscalculation or overconfidence on part of uh, the Russians. And, and part of that goes to, I mean, NATO's intelligence gathering was really good. Um, often that's not the case, but in this particular case it was. And we revealed to the Kremlin that we knew part of the plan. If you recall, we were a step ahead when the Russians were planning uh, false flag operations and so on. We announced that and we announced those. So we were a step ahead uh, almost the entire way, and yet the Russians came anyway. Um, so this would have been a form of deterrence by denial had it actually succeeded. Uh, it was an attempt, um, and I'll get into a little more about deterrence by denial and the strengths that it might offer for us. But uh, so that's one thing you got to expect. Obviously, your adversaries might miscalculate um, when you don't want them to, especially. But uh, second one, time not on Putin's side. So this goes back to some of the social science literature on deterrence all the way back to the 1950s and 60s, and especially in the 80s, um, where Richard Ned LeBeau is writing, and he says that it seems to him most of the deterrence failures were not because your adversary saw a target of opportunity or a window of opportunity and lunged, um, but more that the adversary perceived time to, to be running out, that the previous measures uh, he or she had taken to achieve their objectives were not working and that the balance of military power was shifting uh, away from it uh, was not going to be in his favor. So uh, waiting was not an option. So a strike now or um, the situation would be even worse. Perhaps you wouldn't uh, be able to strike at all. So that does tie into uh, one of these strategic goals um, that Bob mentioned, which is you know, uh, previous efforts to keep Ukraine from sliding away from Russia's orbit into the Western orbit had apparently failed, um, and so um, and the situation looked like it was getting worse from the point of view of the Kremlin. Third, lack of will, um, as demonstrated by use of sanctions instead of military force. Uh, Lawrence Fried, I'm sure everyone's afraid, or, uh, sorry, aware of his name, but uh, in a lot of literature on sanctions and more and more, the most recent literature coming out says they are essentially uh, becoming less and less effective, uh, probably because they've been overused. But um, so that's a separate issue we can get into. That's going to be probably a separate chapter <coughs> in the report that I put together at the end of all of this in any case. And then not using military force. So the other part of it is that usually military force, if used properly, it can be a strong deterrent. Um, we took that off the table, we the West, I think for good reasons initially, uh, and for some other reasons that were probably not uh, necessarily as, as good, but made sense in any case. Um, there's no reason for us to necessarily jump into a major conflict uh, that nobody in the West really wanted in any case. So, um, but anyway, that's uh, answer number three, the special case. Um, I'm drawing a lot here from Bob. I apologize for paraphrasing a lot of the things he said, but um, where the Russians see Ukraine is a different sort of thing. So it would have taken us probably more uh, efforts and maybe cost us more to try to deter Russia. And we did not necessarily appreciate that. You know, so the point of reference for Russia, for Putin, for the Kremlin was different than the point of reference for the West, and we didn't <coughs> fail to appreciate that uh, going into it. So, uh, lack of focus is the fifth. And Jim Moynihan um, says, "Look, we didn't, we forgot to really include the larger picture, the grand strategic goals of Russia, Ukraine being only the first step here, and without that larger context, uh, our deterrence efforts were not going to necessarily succeed." Uh, except by perhaps uh, you know, uh, coincidence or chance or luck or something. Um, and then uh, Bettina Rents, uh, the inconsistency argument. So the West NATO especially has been really inconsistent in uh, its approach to trying to deter Russia in recent history. And um, so why should we expect uh, our deterrence uh, 
all of a sudden to have succeeded in February where um, we were just not sending really strong messages uh, to the Kremlin earlier on and uh, so on. So, um, next slide, please. Okay, so none of those answers direct, directly addresses <coughs> the West strategic challenge, in my view, um, which is part of what, you know, all of those six answers combined with a, I'll, I'll call the seventh one, is looking at this from a strategic and military mm -hmm. sort of problem. Whereas the West is always challenged by a fait accompli that happens within the first four or five days or so of a conflict. Think of the Saddam's invasion of Kuwait uh, back in the 18 or 1989, 90, um, and the West eventual response to that. Um, so we're normally out of position to really deter effectively, prevent that fait accompli. Um, and then we like the, in the middle part of the conflict spectrum, the West has the advantage there. Our troops are better trained, our doctrines uh, really good. Um, equipment is uh, superior to pretty much anything that's out there. We're not as good in the protracted conflict phase for very various reasons. <coughs> it's not just the political will that our election cycles change every four or eight years and so our larger grand strategic or uh, foreign uh, policy goals might also change radically, perhaps, in 180 degrees uh, because of that cycle, but also because, and I think the Russians and others had some intelligence on this, but our defense industrial base uh, just was not there anymore to support uh, the massive production, uh, the numbers and everything, ammunition of all types and so on, to sustain a protracted conflict. We're taking the steps now to address some of that, um, we need, I think, a more concerted effort to do that. We're doing some, look at some of the DOD traffic and everything. Um, contracts have been let to try to close some of the gaps. But we still have gaps that if we're going to deter in the Pacific, you know, China, Korea, and so on, uh, elsewhere. Um, and we just haven't, we didn't have reliable data from a major, large-scale combat operation as, such as this to uh, to channel into industry leaders and to really shape the uh, production, the capacity and uh, production part of the equation. And then we have supply chain issues also that are becoming more and more complex um, that we have to address. To give you one example, one uh, javelin round uses something like 200 semiconductors, which I found astounding when I discovered <coughs> that. And uh, we all know that the supply chain challenges for uh, semiconductors and, uh, you know, for procuring them, acquiring them, and so forth, are, um, require some uh, serious thinking in order to, uh, to solve. So the West is normally out of position in order to prevent a fait accompli. And this one, you know, almost worked. If you look at the Russo reports and some of the others, uh, the Russians came pretty close. Remember, the Russians had similar assumptions uh, to the West as far as how long the Ukrainians were actually going to be able to hold out. So it was not really unreasonable for them to have tried this approach. And this is the thing that beats your other deterrence efforts. If they think they can get what they want to get within the first four or five days while NATO sorting out what its response is going to be. Um, and if you haven't addressed that in your deterrence efforts, um, then you aren't really going to, your chances of deterring your adversary uh, or diminished a great bit. So, um, but we like that we're out of position, but we like the idea of, of trying to deter through punishment as opposed to deterring by denial. By inflicting costs, sanctions, and so on, um, we are not directly involved in the conflict. We can influence it to some degree. We can manage the escalation side of the, of the uh, equation by not triggering um, the radical escalation on the part of our adversary, by not introducing our own military forces and so forth, that sort of thing. So we are comfortable um, with deterrence by uh, punishment. But historically, we can see that the deterrence by punishment is really less effective overall than deterrence by denial, by a factor of like seven or eight. Um, even though it's difficult to prove whether deterrence works, Proving a negative is, is a hard thing to do. It's also, by the way, difficult to prove that coercion or compellence actually works as well, or what part of the 
your compellence effort was the key in getting your adversary to do what you wanted uh, him or her to do. Uh, so it's, part, it's more art than science here, but we're able to deduce by historical record the use of alliances, strong alliances that are not so strong that they are provocative, but strong enough they actually can deter conflict. It seems to, a safe, uh, safe bet to make. You know, it's not conclusive. Again, it's not a science. So. Uh, next slide, please. And just to flip over to the Pacific for a second to give you a picture of the strategic problem on a larger scale. Um, and lots of literature out there on the Taiwan scenarios and so on. But I wanted you to get a feel for the missile belts, the first, second, third order uh, defensive belts. They're fairly significant, being uh, getting worse over time, worse from a Western perspective. Uh, better from a you know a PRC or Beijing perspective, obviously, um, and then according to the Lampac uh, uh, conference back in the middle of May, lots of important folks I think were talking about uh, the situation, um, not necessarily getting uh, you know uh, egregiously worse for the West at this stage, but there are some concerns and there are lots of. Uh, voices out there saying deterrence is beginning to erode in the, in the Pacific. Uh, Elvis Colby, famous for uh, his book, Strategy of Denial, maybe you have, many of you have read it, I hope, um, that essentially we are losing the window of being able to move forces in any number into the theater without incurring more risk. Sure, freedom of navigation operations, other um, are occurring uh, routinely, but that's not the same as introducing additional forces, um, hardware and so forth that might tip the balance away from China even further. Um, and they appear to be, according to some of the intelligence reports that are now open source, appear to be worried more and more about uh, what Richard Nedlebo pointed to as the uh, balance tipping away from China and that, um, that sooner rather than later um, is what when they'll have to act and so on. So okay. just wanted to provide that perspective because whatever we talk about here for Ukraine, ideally part of it ought to be transferable to other theaters, but the challenges are even uh, greater in many of those other theaters. So next slide, please. So the uh, getting back to the fait accompli, I think um, the Ukrainian approach when they uh, essentially rationalized all of their territorial defense forces, I'll call them that loosely, there, lots of um, units fell then underneath the uh, IDF, the uh, and, uh, TDF, sorry, uh, territorial defense forces as of 1 January, but there were no funding streams set up yet. They had some <coughs> veterans from previous conflicts with the Russians, but they didn't really have uh, wide-scale uh, organized collective training Nobody was really read into the uh, general defense plan. They cooperated with some soft units and so forth. But overall, they appear to have done just enough to blunt, slow down, surprise the Russian fait mm -hmm. de attempt. Um, and you can see some of the pictures there, we you know a uh, National Guard Battalion, or parts of that uh, retained National Guard Battalion at Hostomo Airport seemed to have done just enough, knock out uh, the first uh, aircraft Russian aircraft that attempted to land there, um, and roadblocks that were set up. In some ways, they did enough to free up regular Ukrainian forces to do their missions as well, so that's important. Had they been, uh, had that system been more routinized, had there been funding streams, had the training been uh, integrated, um, then I think they could have probably even accomplished more. Uh, others, uh, the, uh, the Finns have a similar concept. Um, the Poles and the, some of the Baltic states have a similar total defense or uh, comprehensive defense concept. Um, however, and so do the Taiwanese, however, in many cases, these are, these are really on paper more than uh, in, in reality. They're not training, they're not rolled into uh, a coherent defensive plan, but they could be. So to defeat a fait accompli, in some ways you already have to be there. You have to be in position. The West can't push any more hardware into position without uh, increasing risk, as we saw. Uh, 
but it can help those forces that are there. It can help train, it can help uh, supply, and it can help uh, in other ways with intelligence especially. I think NATO, U.S. intelligence, and the early stages of the conflict were key, not only strategic level, but all the way down to tactical level, down to targeting and so on, were very, very important. Um, and in some ways, that sharing of intelligence, I think, could be the glue that holds together an integrated defense concept in various places, and it will maybe do just enough, again, to slow down any aggressor um, and, uh, and to buy time for the West to come up with a more coherent and stronger response. So, so um, some other problems, though, with uh, the TDF, and again, I'm using that term very broadly, even though TDF was a specific organization, but the volunteer forces, uh, volunteer battalions running around uh, with, in some cases, uh, loyalties that were, uh, and a constitution that is not necessarily democratic, we wouldn't necessarily have gone out of our way to support them, but they were doing enough to uh, to fight uh, against the Russian aggression. Uh, some of them farther to the right than we would like them to be. Um, but so I think part of making this a successful concept is a professional education and training program that um, teaches them, you know, law of armed conflict. Uh, ethical decision making and more time and so on, which is important in the long term, and loyalty to the state, i.e., Kiev, uh, as opposed to loyalty to their own particular uh, individual agendas and so forth. So, uh, next slide, please. So to kind of wrap it up, um, the uh, intelligence sharing we need to really hammer out concrete policies of how we're, we're going to do this. We have a tendency in the U.S., sometimes for perhaps good reasons, protecting our sources, but overclassifying things and being really, really stingy about sharing intelligence, almost to the point that that the value of that intelligence, once it is shared, is not as useful as it might have been had it been shared in a more timely manner. So we need to figure that out, and we need to work out uh, with whom and what we're going to share when we know it, and so on. Uh, and that, that'll be, again, the glue. The industrial capacity problem, we need to fix that. That's a separate chapter, um, but I just need to mention that as part of how we're going to approach deterring the protracted conflict. <clears throat> and there are some other things there. The integration of territorial defense forces and this total defense concept or comprehensive defense concept is you know, can translated uh, both ways. is not going to be as effective if um, the Poles aren't cross-training, cross-border training with uh, Baltic states and Ukrainians at some point when their status is resolved, the alliance question is resolved, should also be training cross-border with Poles and so on. Um, and they should be training at both the regular and the irregular forces. Um, integrated air defense networks will, will be key, I am sure, moving forward. That's pretty obvious. I think everyone would agree with that point. A couple Army implications at the bottom there. Um, we are seeing evidence that our approach to training Ukrainians to fight like us is not as productive as we would like. And we have to remember that learning air land battle, we started doing that in the 1980s. We didn't really, it took us about a decade to kind of get it, cycling units through National Training Center and building a culture. It doesn't happen in just two or three months, so we can't really have expected the Ukrainians to have picked it up. Um, as quickly as we would like them. So we need to be able to train the proxies and help them fight the way they already are organized and cultured to fighting. And we have to, uh, so we have to figure out ways to adjust our doctrine accordingly so that we can do that more effectively moving forward. So um, consumption rates for LESCO, I think I mentioned already, and scalable ADA, long range fires, et cetera, training on those. Um, so I will end there, there are some caveats the security dilemma problem, you don't want to um, increase your defensive capability too quickly uh, and be too strong to the point that it provokes your adversary into attacking and you end up with the very thing you wanted to deter in the first place. Um, and then the threat of militarizing your civil society by having irregular units well armed out there and everything who decide to start following their own agenda rather than yours. All right, thanks. That's uh, my last slide is just say, hey, uh, 
Any follow-on questions or anything, please uh, get in touch with us and please follow uh, the press and its podcast and SSI and so on. I'll turn it over to John now. Thanks, Tony. While I await uh, my <coughs> slides to come up, uh, again, my name is John Denny. I'm a research professor here at the Army War College. And uh, let me do a little bit of context setting before I launch into my slides. And that, uh, as you can gather from our approach to this issue uh, and the panel we've put together here, we're working on a multi-author uh, study. Really, it's going to be a, a series of studies, what we're calling a federated approach. And uh, there are groups of us or individuals examining different parts of the puzzle. Uh, you heard uh, Bob and Tony uh, with their portions. Mike is going to be tackling at least one bit of this, including U.S. security cooperation with the Ukrainians, as well as uh, the history of relations uh, in that part of the world. The bit that I'm working on is uh, allied support for Ukraine. And primarily here we're focused on European allies. And I'll note that even though my name is the only one on that lead slide there, I'm writing mine in collaboration with a co-author, Dr. Lisa Aronson. Uh, Lisa is my counterpart at National Defense University down in Washington, D.C. She's a research professor there, studies Europe and NATO as I do. And so the two of us are tackling this issue of allies uh, in support of Ukraine. All right, next slide, please. Here's what I'll be uh, briefly offering to you. I'll start broadly talking about the role of allies in American strategy, why we think we need allies, and then I'll take a dive into some of the details of, of what we are observing right now. And uh, just a brief note on the, uh, on the methodology that Lisa and I are employing. We're doing a lot of, uh, a lot of travel, frankly, for this research project, including a lot of personal interviews. <clears throat> we began in Washington, D.C. with desk officers at our State Department and Defense Department, uh, but then grew that to include the foreign embassies in Washington of key allies that we're examining in Europe. We've got a group of about eight or nine that we're looking at. Uh, you can probably guess at uh, the countries that are in that group, including Germany, France, the U.K., Poland, Romania, Finland, et cetera. Um, and then we've done some uh, extensive overseas travel, visiting the capitals to speak to both government officials as well as academic and think tank experts. And we've also had the opportunity to visit um, maintenance and uh, material transfer locations in Eastern Europe, including in Poland. So let's go to the next slide, please. Now, starting again, most broadly, you're going to see unfolding before you here a series of American defense strategies, Quadrennial Defense Review Reports, or QDRs, security strategies, et cetera, stretching back almost 30 years. The remarkable consistency of all of these documents that you see unfolding before you, from the presidency of Bill Clinton, who was kind of a, a reluctant, frankly, transatlanticist, given what brought him into office in 1992, through even Donald Trump, who had uh, what can only be described as a challenging relationship with, with Europe, uh, the remarkable consistency among all these documents is they all have one form or another of this notion, and that is that we Americans prefer to work in the world with allies. And by the way, we prefer to work with Europeans uh, among them. So this has been a remarkable consistency of post-Cold War. I mean, you could even draw this back into the Cold War, perhaps. But it's, it's a clear thread through all of these strategies, these documents, uh, going back nearly the last 30 years. Next slide, please. Now, why is this the case? I mean, some of these reasons are going to be obvious to those of you in the room, right? We clearly believe we get more legitimacy internationally, but also domestically when we have allies by our side. Uh, the third bullet there is, is the one that is often most surprising, especially when I uh, brief this topic in Europe. Europeans, many of them, frankly, don't believe that the American military which uh, you know, is so large and capable. We really need European allies with their, some have called them bonsai armies, bonsai militaries by our side. I, I think from an American perspective, in fact, we do. Uh, we need their capability, we need their capacity. Remember that redundancy is no sin when it comes to national security and military affairs in particular. And so you can think back to the surge in Iraq, the surge in Afghanistan. Those frankly would not have been possible without allies by America's side. So this is a very interesting irony of uh, the post-World War II era, uh, certainly the post-Cold War era, uh, 
and that is namely that the one country in the world <coughs> with the ability and often the will to change political outcomes anywhere on the globe prefers and feels like it needs allies by its side to do those things. And then finally there, the last bullet, uh, we have historical relationships based upon uh, historical practice, but also culture, in some cases common language, working with our European allies. So these are all the reasons why all those document you, documents you saw piling up on the last slide preach this gospel of allies by our side. So now let's take a dive into what we've seen unfolding now in the Ukraine war. And again, a lot of this is based on research over the last eight months. Next slide, please. Uh, and much of it, most of it, based upon interviews. Uh, first, let's start here with the strategic approach. So what's driving the allies, European allies in particular, again, to do what they're doing in uh, or with regard to aiding and assisting Ukraine? Uh, it shouldn't surprise you. You know, we Americans have a strategy for just about everything. Uh, in part, that's thanks to the large defense establishment that we have. We've got the personnel and the resources to do that kind of work. Most of our European allies do not. And so many of them, most of them, do not have formal strategies for their approach to the war. Instead, they're driven by what we're calling some strategic imperatives or rationales, and they vary depending upon where you go across the continent. Some countries, obviously, uh, those closest to the problem set, you can think of Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, maybe even the Poles, fear that if they don't help, they're next. Others, particularly the Germans, the Finns, very concerned with the rule-based order and maintaining this, especially in Europe. Others are very eager to impose a strategic defeat on Russia. A very small number, particularly the Lithuanians and the Poles, have a cultural affinity for the Ukrainians. And then finally, several allies feel a need to be, uh, to be good partners for Washington. They feel a sense of responsibility. And so they're doing what they can. So there, in sum, is a variety of rationales that are driving what the allies are doing. Next slide, please. Now, how are they doing what they're doing? The patches you see unfolding on the right of the slide are those of uh, some, not all, of the NATO Rapid Deployment Corps, the Gradual um, uh, Readiness Corps, Graduated Readiness Corps, uh, that NATO has at its, disposal, at, at its disposal. Most interestingly, these command and control entities are not being used. Why is that? Well, it, it won't surprise you all to know that you know, NATO doesn't want to pitch this and the West doesn't want to, to pitch their effort as uh, contributing to some sort of a NATO-Russia conflict, right? They're trying to, frankly, in some cases, downplay the role of NATO. So despite the fact that NATO has the ability to uh, command and control the assistance effort, these entities have not been tapped at all. Instead, what we have seen is a, a more of an ad hoc approach. It began first with uh, the American 18th Airborne Corps, which was sent over to Europe initially to help handle refugee flows into Poland. When it was seen that the Poles had uh, most of that effort in hand, the 18th Airborne Corps' mission changed rather quickly to facilitating the delivery of materiel uh, to the Ukrainians. Uh, after that, uh, after the first few months, an, an ad hoc organization called the Security Assistance Group in Ukraine was formed. It was initially, uh, it still is based in Germany, but initially in Stuttgart and uh, it was really based upon borrowed manpower from both U.S. Army Europe and U.S. European Command. In conjunction with that, a U.K.-led International Donor Coordination Center focused primarily on training coordination. Uh, but again, these were largely ad hoc. What we are seeing unfold now, and which should be uh, officially stood up by the end of this calendar year, is a new SAGU entity. It's got its own formal manning document. It'll now, instead of being around 150, 140 personnel, it's going to be as large as 430, 450 or so. And uh, its purpose will be to coordinate all of the materiel and training assistance that is flowing into Ukraine. Uh, we had the opportunity, Lisa and I, to go visit with SAGU personnel there. And we've got a quote there from one of our interviews. It's really a, it remains really a spider web of coordination, a unique bureaucracy. Uh, and so this raises the question, well, what good is NATO in this context then? Even though NATO command and control 
entities have not been used, we still detect in our research that NATO has nonetheless provided the framework necessary. It's sort of greased the skids of coordination, if you will, uh, and enabled a lot of the cooperation to unfold, even through these ad hoc entities. But without U.S., and to a lesser degree, U.K. leadership, uh, it, it's really unclear whether the scale and uh, uh, the, the organization could have unfolded in the way that it did, at least initially in the first year and a half. Next slide, please. Now let's turn to the material assistance and what we're seeing unfold there. It, it won't surprise those of you who've been following this issue that many of our allies in Europe are, uh, they, they've reached the end of their ability to do more on this front. Uh, in fact, they've, many of them have been very public about this. Uh, Joseph Borrell, the uh, uh, really person thought of as the EU foreign minister, spoke rather openly about this about a year ago, saying that uh, European um, inventories were largely tapped out. However, what we've uncovered in some of our research is really a, a tension in the civ mill terms in some of these countries that we were focused on. I won't go into too much detail here, but we've seen examples, a couple of cases in which the military bureaucracies or military entities in some of our allies are unwilling to turn over more. Now, in some cases, that's for good operational reasons. They're concerned about uh, maintaining an inventory in case the Russians come across the border in their countries. But in some cases, it takes more of a bureaucratic overtone. They're concerned that if they give away some of these resources from their inventories, that their civilian counterparts in capitals simply won't provide the funding to replenish those inventories. And so there's a tension here, some of the civilians fearing that the military counterparts are inflating the threat, uh, and some of the civilians frankly telling us that they've got the capacity to do more, even though their militaries are reluctant to do that. <clears throat> In any case, what we've seen across the continent is an unwillingness to put their economies on a wartime footing. Now, we're not at that point here in the U.S. either, but the Russians certainly are. And what we have in the U.S. in the form of a Defense Production Act is at least the ability to uh, incentivize, even with only the threat of employing the DPA, uh, we can sometimes get industry to react a little more uh, quickly than they might otherwise. These kinds of tools largely do not exist among our European allies. And so they have a hard time, for example, getting uh, their orders with their defense manufacturers to the top of the queue. So this is a problem that we've identified, and, and you'll, you'll, you'll see this uh, in our recommendations when our, our report eventually hits the street. Next slide, please. In terms of training assistance, many of the European allies, including the U.S., have had long-standing training efforts underway already with the Ukrainians prior to February of 22. Most of the European allies have been eager to continue this. The challenge that we've seen unfolding, though, is that there are multiple training efforts going on. Uh, there is certainly coordination happening, and uh, in large part that's thanks, again, to the U.K.-led effort to uh, try to corral some of this or at least provide a clearinghouse for that coordination. But there is no standardization yet uh, that we've seen in those training efforts. Uh, one of the challenges, of course, here is that the more training provided by Western militaries for Ukrainian forces, it means necessarily less range time, less opportunities for our own Western forces. Uh, and that is a challenge for our readiness. And then finally, there's lots of training, it seems, at the individual and a small unit level, we see far less training occurring at the collective level. In part, this is due to a lack of range time at those ranges and those maneuver facilities that have the capacity for a battalion and brigade maneuver. Next slide, please. In terms of operational assistance, for classification reasons, I can't go into much detail here. I'll note uh, as an aside that Lisa and I, and I believe my colleagues are, are probably operating under the same constraints, we're going to publish, of course, an open source, I should say an unclassified study, but we will also have a classified annex. And much of the information we're uncovering here under operational assistance, as you can imagine, falls in the classified domain. However, I can note there's been some open source reporting regarding non-U.S. Uh, intel support being provided at both the multilateral and uh, bilateral levels. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of a logistical assistance, the access 
basing authority and overflight rights uh, provided by the Allies for the effort to assist the Ukrainians has really been, frankly, outstanding. Uh, it's uh, at, at a level at which we've been told by our American interlocutors in Europe uh, and in the Pentagon, it uh, contrasts pretty strongly with what we often see in the Indo-Pacific theater. Uh, nonetheless, there are some concerns regarding OPSEC, and I provide two open source examples there. Uh, there are several more in the classified realm, but there are two in the open source there. We saw back this past spring, the, uh, the Poles uncovered a spy ring of Russians uh, or Russian affiliates that were intent on uh, sabotaging some of the rail lines that provide material to the Ukrainians. And then finally, there was a very um, uh, suspicious uh, explosion at a Bulgarian ammunition storage warehouse in July uh, that uh, Bulgarian authorities believe was tied to the effort to provide uh, resources to the Ukrainians. So uh, nonetheless, the logistical assistance is really a highlight so far. Uh, That is notwithstanding news just overnight that the Poles may be slowing down their efforts uh, perhaps only on a bilateral level, hopefully, but slowing down their efforts to aid the Ukrainians in um, what may be a, a growing conflict over <clears throat> the grains trade. Next slide, please. When it comes to measures of effectiveness, the allies across the board lack really any robust measures uh, uh, to determine whether and how uh, they're being successful. Really, the, the only measure that was cited to us over and over again is yards or kilometers gained on the battlefield. Now, that's pretty rudimentary. Um, uh, it's pretty blunt. It doesn't provide us the, uh, the specificity we need to refine the training and perhaps even the material and operational support that we're providing to the Ukrainians. Now, there, in some cases, there's lots of anecdotal feedback, for example, from their embassies in Kyiv, or in some cases for, from personal contacts between um, soldiers who happen to know each other in the Ukrainian military and in counterpart militaries. Um, and then finally, we're beginning to see some anecdotal evidence of uh, MOEs filter out from the uh, contractors that are sometimes on site in Ukraine. Next slide, please. Now, what's the, the so what of all of this for the Allies, and especially for the U.S. and our strategy. Uh, first and foremost, there is a risk we detect in, uh, in terms of escalation. Some Allies leaning very far forward in doing what they're doing, either in terms of the materiel or especially in the operational realm. That creates some risks for escalation. Uh, but the fact is that in some cases, the American perspective is almost a little schizophrenic here. Uh, we benefit to some degree by, the, by some allies that have a little more operational freedom, a little more um, permissive authority to engage in some activities in Ukraine that we are preventing our military from doing. And we gained, frankly, some intel benefit from that. On the flip side, we also see a risk of a burden sharing for the Americans. I mentioned earlier several of our allies in Europe running out uh, of key capabilities, uh, in some cases capacity, and uh, they'll need to be backfilled uh, primarily by the Americans. Uh, Overall, we also see key capabilities, U.S. capabilities, uh, in Europe are therefore critical in the short run. It's very clear that if, uh, if there is a contingency in the Indo-Pacific that the Americans must respond to, the allies in Europe are going to be challenged to a great degree to try to fill some of the key gaps that uh, might be withdrawn from Europe. Uh, you can think about long-range fires um, and uh, other enablers that would have utility not simply in a Europe land-centric theater, but also in the Indo-Pacific, a more maritime uh, or maybe even air domain-centered um, theater. And then finally, the implication there, I talked about the command and control. You know, it's really unclear to us, and I think we're really dubious about whether there's any substitute for U.S. organization, command and control, or scale when it comes to assisting Ukraine uh, in doing what we're doing um, for them. Uh, And and I'll end there. Thank you very much. Uh, You could go to the last slide if you'd like, but that's the end of my, uh, my content. I look forward to your questions and thoughts. Thanks. Once again, I'd like to thank 
New America for the opportunity to present here today and contribute to the conversation and look forward to additional conversations going forward.